right. How's everybody doing today? Ever since I can remember, art has been my preferred communication method of choice. Growing up as a kid in my father's house in West Baltimore or over at my grandmother's house over on Rosedale, I can remember being the aluminum foil bandit and a Reynolds rap thief, taking everyday household items and crafting my own toys and action figures for me to play with. The thing I, love about, I loved about art, though, was its ability to help people be expressive in their craft. And for me, that actually took place after my mother's death in two, um, when I was six years old, during giving birth to my sister. At that time, I started to use art as a form of expression. And I carried, on it with, I carried that on with me to this day. The thing I loved about art, the thing I still love about art, is its ability to make people feel. I always tried to do that in my work, and I admired artists that did the same. But it was much deeper than their ability to, to, to make people feel their sorrow or their pain. It was an artist's ability to use their craft and the inspiration behind their life story to inspire people to action, both politically and socially. I always admired that about a lot of artists, and I hope to do that myself with my own work. So one can really understand how it was a struggle for me playing in a professional, uh, at the professional level as an NFL player and constantly having to bend myself over backwards to make other people happy, to be saddled with other people's beliefs and expectations of what I should be doing with my time, my energy, and my platform. It was very frustrating to constantly be fielding questions from owners and coaching staffs that I played for about why I still lived in the city of Baltimore during the offseason. It was frustrating to constantly answer questions about why I would hang out in areas of the city that were considered less than reputable, with people whose lengthy arrest records and backgrounds had people like my owners and people around the team nervous. Not taking into account that as a young man, I've never been arrested, never been in trouble, never been pulled over, never given anybody a reason to worry about my character, but all of a sudden, it's my job to dance to the, uh, to the beat of somebody else's tune. I developed a sense very quickly from my own personal experience that as a black man in the NFL, it was my position to be only partially seen, but never truly heard, understood, or represented. And I got fed up with that pretty quickly. So fast forward a little bit to the existential moment when my life changed which actually ended up taking place after my release from the Cincinnati Bengals in 2013. During this time, I was able to come back to the city of Baltimore. I was able to spend time with my children that I was never able to do so before because of my obligations as an athlete. For the first time, I wasn't being pulled this way and that way, and I could actually be present in the moment, which was an amazing experience for me as a father for the first time. During this time, I was also able to lock myself into my studio and to really devote serious time and effort into my craft as an artist, being expressive with my writing and my painting and the different forms of expression that I felt like taking on at the time. But more than anything, I was able to contemplate what it might feel like to be able to take, a full, to take all of my time and to dedicate that time and energy towards where my real passion was, which is into the kids and the, city and the people of my city in Baltimore how to invest my time, my energy, my resources, and my passions into my community in a way that was not only tangible for the kids and the people that I would work with, but that would, lend, that would end up taking us to the future in a way that would provide a platform for change. So obviously when going through this conundrum and thinking about what I was comfortable doing, there were a lot of things that I had to weigh. On one hand, you had your career, my career as an athlete, very well compensated uh, financially. You have the joy of being able to have people cheer your name on Sundays. You have the, the ego pat of being able to have people run up to you on the streets and ask you for your autograph, run up to you in the store and sing your praises about your college days. But one of the things that I realized that I would get from my career as an artist and an activist that I never would have been able to get from my career as an athlete is the fact that on a personal level, I would actually be able to serve in a way that I was never allowed to before. 
I would actually be able to dedicate 110% of my energy, my time, and my resources into the most vulnerable areas in our community that needed it the most. I would be able to use this platform that I had built for myself playing a kid's game to actually change the lives of the kids in my community. So I made the decision to transition away from the NFL and to take on this position as an artist, educator, activist, and organizer full time. Over the next two years, I went about the process of learning what real activism was. And that's confusing to some people, but I myself had become a believer of the whole idea that just by showing up to marches and tweeting and Instagramming and sharing think piece articles online, that I was doing my part in my community as an activist and social organizer. I'm sorry to burst some bubbles in this room when I tell you that's not the case. At the end of the day, change has never been the direct result of any march. It has never been the result of any, of any retweet. It has never been the direct result of anybody sharing anything. What it is, is the direct, direct result of organizing, of being politically active, of being socially conscious, and understanding that we all have a personal responsibility to be a part of the change that we want to see in the world. I was able to leverage my position as an artist in this right, because art is one of the few lanes that you can use to actually inspire people towards action. One of the things I've always loved about art is that it can provide the spark that can start a movement. But without the real organized action that is to follow, the memory of this movement will be reduced to just being remembered as a moment in time. So how do we really initiate these changes? What most people don't realize is that real activism is seldom ever exciting and seldom ever sexy. Real activism is ugly. It's long hours. It's late nights and it's early mornings. It's you sacrificing time with your family and your friends. It's you sacrificing personal desires and wants. It's you sacrificing of yourself and your own, and your own personal privilege to make sure that somebody who needs help actually gets that leg up that they need. And the thing that we, both, that we most uh, of all don't realize in this day and age is that for every hour that one spends on the street marching and chanting and having your fist in the air with your bullhorn and your dashiki on, it feels great, right? Feels great to feel like we're a part of something and to be woke. But for every hour of that, there's about 10 hours that nobody on cameras ever sees of organizing, of debating, of arguing, of reconciling, of strategizing, of researching, of studying ways that haven't worked and ways that have, all as a collective to figure out what the best way is to move forward. Doesn't sound as fun, doesn't it? Well, that's the hard work that I found out had to be put in for those two years. And when I finally settled on figuring out exactly how I wanted to impact my community, it came in the form of me accepting the position as the, literary, as, the, as the literacy and arts teacher at Matthew A. Henson Elementary in the San Count community servicing uh, our students on the west side. Why did I pick this school? I picked this school because I actually live in this same community. I commute three, I, I commute three minutes to work every morning, so those are perks of the job. <laughs> Obviously, it's nowhere near as glamorous as my, NAS, as my last profession. A lot, a lot fewer people running up to you asking for your autograph on the street. A lot fewer people patting you on the back. But one of the things that you get when you actually teach in the community that you live in is the students in your school actually know you outside of their school building. They know where you live and that they can knock on your door if need be. They see you on the streets, at the gas station, and at the corner store. They actually attend your camps and your mentorship programs. They attend your holiday giveaways in the, in the summer and the wintertime. You're actually an attainable and touchable resource for them, the same way every single neighborhood resource that we have should be. You're actually somebody that they can reach out and touch and access and figure out how they can use and leverage that position to benefit themselves in the long run. And with me being in such a, a close proximity, it also gives me the ability to know where they come from, to understand the nuance of their community, to know what the pitfalls that they have to avoid every day are, 
to understand what they're, leaving, how, what they're leaving home from in the morning and what they're going back to in the evening. It's very important. So one can understand how I felt having this kind of connection with my kids. When I came into my classroom on the first day of school coming back from winter break, to find my classroom was 38 degrees. To find out I was now tasked with the responsibility of teaching class after class after class of my children who I had to watch huddled together, bundled up in coats and jackets trying to keep warm. You can imagine how I felt watching the kids that didn't have these garments, that didn't have winter coats or scarves or, or jackets or gloves huddled up underneath the arms of their classmates. You can imagine how I felt when I asked them how their day was going, and I had my elementary school kids telling me how they thought they had frostbite, how they couldn't feel their hands or their toes, how they were freezing, how they were miserable. Matter of fact, you know what? Take all that back. You can't. None of you can understand that. You want to know why? These are my kids that I'm talking about. Each and every single one of them is an extension of one of my own children. And unless you actually know them the way that I do, you can't understand what something like that feels like. Unless you actually know their stories, unless you actually know what they've been through, unless you actually know what their passions are, unless you actually know what they're leaving in the morning and what they're coming back to every single night when they go home, you don't understand what something like that feels like to see kids that you know, love, and care about suffer in that way. You see, each and every single one of these kids may be invisible to you because you don't go home and see them on your way there. You don't actually interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So you may not see them, but I do. And it was impossible for me to fathom that the world could actually see these kids, how beautiful they are, how brilliant they are, and exactly what they were going through, and not feel that empathy. So I filmed a video where I literally asked them their ex those exact same questions. How are you feeling? What's today like for you? What do you think is going on? Why do you think that they have you in school this way? That video went, ended up going viral, and it led to me being able to link up with two amazing young black women from the city of Baltimore to start a campaign called Operation Heat. Now, with this campaign, we ultimately were able to raise over $85,000 in a little under a month. And with this money, we've been able to go out and we've been able to buy space heaters. We've been able to buy winter coats. We've been able to buy scarves, gloves. We've been able to buy feminine care products for our young women. We've been able to buy so many of these things that are the basic necessities of a kid being able to get a proper education that for years and years our, our most vulnerable students have been deprived of. And at the end of the day, one of the greatest things that we've been able to show them is how immediate action can come from advocacy and organizing in a real organized and efficient, pragmatic way. They've been able to see how they themselves can be a part of the change that they wish to see in their own environments. They've been able to see examples upon example upon example of people seeing them for the first time, really seeing them, and the reality of what they're faced with on an everyday basis and saying this isn't right. The crazy thing that frustrates me though is that when I was a kid going to Baltimore City Public Schools, I was attending schools where there were 30 to 40 students in a class. We were studying from 10 to 15 year old textbooks where we had no resources, no computers, no calculators, no nothing, essentially. When I was in this environment, I actually believed that there was something wrong with me as a student. I felt like I couldn't learn properly. I felt like I was dumb, like there was something deficient in me that was supposed to be there that I just wasn't blessed with. It wasn't until I was relocated out to Howard County for high school that I realized exactly how much of a lie that was. All of a sudden, we have resources now. All of a sudden, which was a 30 to 40 kid classroom, was all of a sudden 15 to 20. All of a sudden, the books were new. 
All of a sudden, we got calculators in every class. All of a sudden, there's a computer in every class for every student. I've been force fed a lie. Because this whole time, I thought that there was something wrong with me as a student. I thought that there was something deficient in me that everybody else just innately was given, and I realized I wasn't a bad student. I was just never driven or expected to be a good one. I was never provided with the tools or the resources that make being a good student easier. I was never provided with the, the, the resources in my community that make living that type of lifestyle easier. I was deprived. I was successful in spite of my circumstance. But I think anybody sitting in this room from this city knows that that's not, most story, that's not the story for most people. So now you can pretty much in this room probably feel my frustration when I think about the fact that today, after years outside of the school, I'm back and I'm teaching in classrooms that are still packed with 30 to 40 kids learning out of 10 to 15 year old textbooks with five to six computers that might or might not work to split up between 40 and 50 kids. How, how is this possible? Didn't I just come from, oh, where is the school located? And that's part of the problem. You see, if we don't have to reach out and touch them, if we can't see them, if we can't understand on a, basis, on a base level based on our own sight and experience, it's almost as if they're not there. If we can't hear them, if we can't see them, they don't exist until the cries of the unseen and the unheard become too deafening to ignore. You see, in 2015, a whole lot of attention was paid to Freddie Gray's lengthy arrest record before his body was even laid to rest after he was killed by, while in police custody. I find this ridiculous and insulting because of the fact that Freddie Gray went to the exact same school that I teach at today. Where was society's investment in him for his entire life? Where were the resources for him to get an accurate, uh, 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 a good education? Where were the resources for him to have a decent housing situation? Where were the resources for him to have a childhood? So what that basically says to me is, we're fine as a, as, a, uh, as a society assigning judgment. We're fine as a society assigning blame. But what we're not fine with as a society is seeing where there's a need and how we can help while there's still time. So I choose to use my position as an educator, as an artist, as an activist to speak to these issues, to make it so that they can't just be ignored and overlooked anymore. And hopefully, the example that is being provided to my students will show them that they themselves can be a part of the change that they want to see by using their voices, by using their platforms, by using their organizational skills that they are learning every single day to change their environments, to change their communities. But it doesn't start with them. It starts with all of us. Because at the end of the day, regardless of what lane you're in, regardless of what your career path is, we all have a personal responsibility to do right by future generations. And how we handle ourselves in this moment determines the opportunity that our kids and our kids' kids will have. I have a responsibility to sow love, culture, history, ethics into my children in a way that will allow them to develop and I can, uh, I can see the greatness that I know lies dormant inside them begin, begin to cultivate and develop itself. That's my responsibility. My charge to everybody in this room is for everyone to find what their responsibility is and to see where they can have the most impact and to do all that's necessary to help us develop this next generation so that they can self-identify what, what their most desires, are, what their utmost desires are for their futures and they could find ways to get there in a pragmatic and organized way. Thank you very much.